we are talking about immersion cooling today. You guys, I love this stuff. Back when we had in-person board design conferences, somehow I would always be drawn to that tank filled with, I didn't know what. Inside was a liquid cooled design, but honestly, it was really just the wonder of it all that drew my attention. Wow, this kind of stuff works? Yes, in fact it does, and quite well. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Immersion cooling is becoming more and more mainstream today, and it can be a great solution for data center applications. But it does come with a unique set of challenges. We don't just go dunking our operating PCB into a tank of salt water. That would be bad. In this episode of Chalk Talk, I sit down with Brian Niehoff from Samtech and talk about the what, where, and how of immersion cooling, how it differs from traditional air cooling, and what kind of connector solutions are best for your next immersion-cooled application. All right, let's go get cool. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from Samtech. Hi, Brian. Thank you so much for joining me. Hey, Amelia. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Now, Brian, we're talking about the benefits and applications of immersion cooling today. But before we get into immersion cooling, Brian, why do we need immersion cooling in the first place? Hasn't air cooling been working just fine? That's a great question. And honestly, air cooling has been doing a great job for us. You know, there's data centers all across the country that are using air cooling, but it does have some limitations. So for instance, let's look at the blade at the top right corner there. You can see there are fans inside the box. The main purpose of those is just to blow cold air across the components that are in there and keep everything within an operating temperature. However, those server fans actually consume about 20% of the power in a data center. So then you also have to look at the cooling units there. If you look at the picture on the left hand side, you can see the arrows pointing to the HVAC systems up on top. Those would be located on the roof somewhere. And those consume about 40% of the power in a data center. So right there, you're looking at a good amount of power that's being taken up without any compute function at all. Not only on top of that, you've got the additional cost of those HVAC units and you have to have redundancies there. If a cooling unit goes down, you can't have the temperature within your, your data center go up. So you've got to make sure that you can cover that outage there. Also, there on the right-hand side, you can see that a typical data center will have a hot aisle and a cold aisle built into it. And that additional space that's required is actually taking up about half of your available compute space. So your overall density is a lot lower than it really could be. I definitely can see that. Now, Brian, keeping all of that in mind, what do you see are the biggest challenges of air cooling solutions today? Once again, let's look at power consumption. About 45 to 60% of a data center's power consumption is going to come from your HVAC and your rack mounted fans. The overall cost for a cooling infrastructure, and you know just simply from your house that an HVAC replacement can be quite costly, will take that to an industrial scale and you're adding in significant cost. And so you're looking at about 50% of your overall cost is being placed into power, maintenance, and, and the overall operational cost. And then that's not even mentioning the additional noise that you have from all the fans running. They're going to be in excess of about 85 decibels. Okay, Brian, I'm excited to get into the details of immersion cooling, but before we get started, why should we look at water cooling in the first place? Sure, it's a simple answer here. Let's look at thermodynamics. So with thermodynamics, you have a gas molecule. It's got a very high intermolecular distance. In other words, your molecules are pretty spaced apart. That's why we can move so easily through a gas when compared to a liquid, right? So when you think about a liquid at 70 degrees or air at 70 degrees, which one's going to feel colder? It's going to be the liquid. And that's because the liquid has a better ability to actually remove that heat energy from the system. Before we actually jump into a fully immersion cooled system, why don't we check out water cooling and, and what it's done for us so far. And there in that first picture, you've got an example of some cold plates. The cold plates actually sit directly on top of your ASIC or your CPU or GPU, whatever you have designed there in your server blade. 
but each one of those are going to be set up uniquely for the server in question. So it's not like a commercial off-the-shelf item you can buy and just pop into your server. It's going to have to be specifically designed for that particular system. There on the right-hand corner, you see we've got a bunch of micro blades there. That's kind of a side view of those plates. Those are fins that can get clogged by the water running through there. You can actually have fouling that occurs in there from different bio slimes or other contaminants. So you do have to clean your systems quite a bit. Plus the amount of pressure that you have to run through a system there is gonna be at about 200 PSI. So if you've got a leak that occurs, you could have water all over the place. And then that's not to mention, you're only actually cooling the heavier compute items that are located within that system. So you're still gonna to have to run air fans through that system to make sure the rest of the components do not get too hot. That makes sense. So Brian, I would imagine that water cooling has some very specific related challenges. Right. So you're going to have to run a lot of pressure through that system. You're still going to have to have something that's going to actually cool the liquid running through the system. So that's additional cooling units there. Every system is going to be a custom design. You're going to have to make sure you're continually cleaning the system as well. Otherwise, your efficiency is going to go down and those micro channels will clog up and you're not going to get the cooling that you should from it. And then once again, you still are going to require some air movement to cool the rest of your components. Sure, that makes sense. Now, how does an immersion cooling system really work? Brian, can you walk us through the steps? Absolutely. So there are two types of fluids that are used in immersion cooling. The first one we're going to check out here is a two-phase, but there also is a single phase. It's called a two-phase or two-pick simply because you're dealing with a liquid that's going to boil and turn into a gas. And so with a two-phase liquid, it does have an extremely low boiling point. And that's what causes the fluid to turn into the gas once it's going over top of your ASIC or your CPU if that's located within your server there. So the boiling action, if you look at the picture there on the right-hand side, all the white there up top, that's all the bubbles coming to the surface and, and going into the air above. That's what causes the movement in the system. There's no need for additional pumps or anything like that. The fluid itself causes the movement of the fluid through the system. Because the devices are, are fully immersed there, you're cooling everything at once. There's no need for additional air or anything like that. When we look at the image there on the left-hand side, you can see the wrapped coil. That's how we turn that gas back into a liquid and pump it back down into there. So you do still have to have a cooling system of some sort to make sure that you're able to condense the gas back into a liquid and then the process starts over again, right? So the system has to be sealed or else you will actually lose some of the gas or some of the fluid there due to evaporation. Brian, what kind of challenges are you seeing with this type of solution? So with a two-phase immersion cooling setup, the main cost is going to come from your fluid. It can range anywhere from $300 to $400 per gallon. Your system setup can also be fairly pricey as well just because you do have to ensure that your system is sealed. You just can't use an open tank or any kind of just generic system. You do have to make sure that it's well sealed and it's honestly difficult to find a leak if there is one that occurs in the system. That's an issue as well. Something else that you have to consider with a two-phase immersion cooling setup is because you are boiling the liquid there on the CPU, you're gonna have micro cavitations that form and that can also cause corrosion. So that's something you'll have to watch for. And of course, the fluid evaporates and you could constantly have to replace it. And at three to $400 per gallon, that's not ideal, right? For sure. Now, Brian, that last solution was a two phase immersion cooling setup. Is there also a single phase solution as well? Absolutely. And so the single phase is called single phase because it remains a liquid. There's no boiling that actually occurs here. So the liquid dielectric remains a liquid and you don't have to worry about evaporation from this sort of setup. You can actually use an open top setup similar to what's pictured here. Submer is one of those manufacturers that makes an open top unit that can be used for single phase immersion cooling. From there, one of the other benefits that you can have is that you've got a higher density of compute power within the same footprint. So on a normal air-cooled system, you can typically do about 18 kilowatts of power through an air-cooled system. However, with an immersion-cooled system, you can do anywhere from 20 kilowatts to 200 kilowatts, depending on your setup. So your overall compute density goes up significantly. 
Okay, so what's all included here? With the single phase cooling, we can use a tank that's completely self-contained. It can be set pretty much anywhere because there's not anything outside of the actual system itself that's going to be needed. They're completely self-contained, so they can be open top. You don't have to worry about evaporation. No additional water cooling is going to be required. The fluid that we're going to be looking at today, it's called electrical by engineered fluids. It goes for about $64 a gallon, so already you're looking at a fairly significant savings there if you compare it to the, the single phase. It doesn't boil off, and as far as thermal efficiency goes, it's about 1,600 times more thermally efficient than air. Okay, Brian. So with any kind of cooling technology, testing is really important, right? What does the testing story look like here? Yeah, so here at SamTech, our overall story is basically our connectors are application agnostic. They can be used in anything from military aerospace to automotive to industrial, medical. They can be used pretty much anywhere. However, we want to know how our connectors are going to perform, and so do our customers that are trying to use them in specific applications. So that's why we got involved here. We noticed that immersion cooling was becoming a growing market. It's still kind of at the beginning, and we wanted to be able to tell our customers or potential customers how our products would perform should they choose to use this sort of setup. So what we're actually doing here is we've partnered with Engineered Fluids. Engineered Fluids makes the dielectric coolant and it is a single phase coolant. What we decided to do is we're testing it with mating on mating and durability. We're doing IRDWV, which that's insulation resistance and dielectric withstanding voltage. CCC, that's current carrying capacity. CC, which is current cycling. LLCR, that's low level circuit resistance. Thermal shock, thermal age. And then we're also doing some SI testing for it all as well. So just kind of checking out our setup here. We had a lot of learning to do along the way. At the beginning, we had to test and retest just to make sure that the placement of our thermocouples and everything else was in alignment. We were actually quite shocked at the amount of power that we could put through some of our connectors here. So we had to upgrade a few systems as well, including the cables running in. But looking at the setup there, you can see in the top right-hand corner, we've got our connectors set up and in the actual immersion cooling dielectric. What is being tested on that right there is the CCC, so current carrying capacity. And in the bottom picture is the cooling tank and the pump. So some of the connectors that we are currently either have tested or will test is our popular C-Ray series. That has been tested and it is completed. The UMPX is currently under test and that is our what we call a micro power system. And then we've also completed the ET60X and that is our power connector. And so that kind of brings us into our next slide here. What are the results? Because that's really the most important thing here, right? So for the ET60X, for the mated assembly, when we compare it for current carrying capacity, when we compare it with air versus the immersion cooled setup, we're going to give you the worst case scenario in both of those. So if you look at the underlying number there, the top one, when we're testing for CCC for a 30 degree C temperature rise, we're getting 52.3 amps per contact, and that's with six contacts powered. So that's still pretty good performance out of a small connector. However, when we place this in electrical from engineered fluids, doing that same exact test setup, we were able to get 161.7 amps per contact with those same six contacts powered. So essentially you can get 110 additional amps out of that contact. It's great performance and it makes sense because going back to a few slides ago, if you think about air versus a liquid, and the ability for it to transfer heat, thermodynamics comes into play here. And that's why it works so much better to be able to pull that heat out with a liquid dielectric versus air. Let's check out the next step here. So looking at the ET60X connector set again, we're gonna look at DWV. So for the breakdown voltage in air, we're looking at approximately 4,100 VAC there versus in electrical, you're looking at 5,000 VAC breakdown voltage. So you're getting basically 800 more VAC there. So even with DWV and CCC, you're getting quite a bit more performance and more capability out of a connector set when you look at it in an immersion cooled environment. Okay, cool. So Brian, what kind of solutions does SamTech have in this space? So 
going back to the products that we either are testing or have tested, we've created a landing page. That's just honestly the easiest way for us to convey all this information. So on samtech.com, if you go in and, and you search for immersion cooling, you'll find our immersion cooling landing page. And here's where you can find the test reports and also the different series that are either have been tested or will be tested. So you can see there the C-Ray and the Extreme Power. The Extreme Power has been tested. And so we've talked about power performance and a lot of other stuff, but something else that we've been testing is our immersion cooled Firefly. And what Firefly is, it's a midboard optical transceiver. And so typically with optics, you don't typically think that you can place that in an immersion cooled environment, right? Because they're they're designed to operate in air. So what we have gone through and done is made a immersion cooled version of the Firefly and it operates quite well. There's no impact on RF or optical performance when placed in an immersion cooled environment. The advantages of Firefly over the uh, QSFP Plus is it's four times smaller and uses 50% less power. So if you're heading towards an immersion cooled setup, the Firefly could be a great option for you to replace certain components on your board with. The particular setup that we're looking at here is the Xilinx VCU 118 development board. And we're actually getting 112 G out of that. So that's using four transceivers at 28 G. The fluid that was done for this particular test was the 3M Fluorinart, the FC43. And that actually is a two-phase fluid as well. So we've done over 2,000 hours of submersion with this particular setup and it can handle pressure up to 60 PSI. So not only can it handle Firefly, can it handle a typical air-cooled environment, but we've also proven that it can work within an immersion-cooled environment as well. Excellent. Well, Brian, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Hey, thanks for having me. It was good to be back, and hopefully we can do it again soon. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from SamTech. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it, it's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal.